I have a funny story to tell you that Chris doesn't know. But anyway, last night my brother, who I was staying with, said, say hi to Cressy for me. And he's called Bennett, and was at John Lewis Group. And he asked Chris to speak. And he said, you know, first I'll say hello, but he said, tell your audience she's going to be absolutely marvellous. So there's the message. Oh, so, Cressy, on that note, yes. I'm going to hand the stage to you um, and let you talk all about being Cressy and everything else. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I should start with full disclosure. This is the first kind of audience like this that I've ever spoken to before. But my first ever job was in venture capital, so I've got some experience there. And uh, I'm about to become an exec for a big company, so I may in the future have some experience there, but I certainly don't have it at the moment. Um, I uh, am totally obsessed with trash. When I first moved to the UK in 2004, being a Canadian, I thought I was going to come here and find that we sorted all these wonderful things out. I thought, oh, you know, we do Our colonial overlord, they're better than us. <laughs> um, actually, you are really, really crap. <laughs> so the year that I arrived, 2004, 100 million tons of waste went to landfill. And that's on a tiny little island with 60 plus million people. So there's no real space for it or excuse for it or however you want to say it. Um, my partner and I tend to do everything backwards, so I start with a problem. I'm a classic entrepreneur in that, in that respect. I think the only successful businesses that we ever should create or should design are ones that fix something. And the only way to do that successfully is to start with a problem and work your way backwards rather than go, I'm going to make some cool, useless thing and convince <laughs> people to buy it. So we start with the problem. The problem that I first fell in love with, because obviously 100 million tons of waste, I can't take that. You know. We lived in a two-bed terrace in Brixton, so there's no room for that kind of material. But I fell in love with this, um, which is 10 tons a year produced by the London Fire Brigade. It is their old hoses. So fire hoses is absolutely stunning material. It's a double wall jacket of nitrile rubber with a nylon woven core. And because you've got these two incredibly durable, wonderful materials totally extruded and sandwiched together, you cannot shred it, melt it, and start again. So it's not like a plastic bottle or a glass <coughs> or anything like that. Can't recycle it. It goes to landfill. And there's not very much of it. Okay, let's be honest. <coughs> Ten tons, I can handle that. Each hose weighs about 18 kilos. I can lift two hoses at one time. So you can imagine one person physically being able to take responsibility for two hoses. When I started, I thought genuinely this would be a charity. I would find some way to solve London's fire hose problem, and I thought that would be the way that I developed a network in the community within the UK. Um, that is actually what happened, except for it's not charity. We wanted to make <coughs> roof tiles. Uh, I am not very fashionable or trendy. I probably would have been voted least likely to be either of those things if we went back to my friends from high school. Um, so when we first started collecting hose, we made things like roof tiles. Uh, but 10 years in, in prolonged UV exposure, the hose would crack and die. So the research and development is quite crucial here. What hose is particularly useful for is making things like this. This is a piece of luggage that we sell for 225 pounds. We sell lots of them. Um, and we sort of could collect globally, annually, in fire hose, the same amount of material that Louis Vuitton uses in its monogram collection. So that's the scale that this particular business could grow to, just in fire hose alone. Not with just London's hoses, there's only 12 tons of that per year. We've been successfully reclaiming most of Britain's hoses since 2010. The third thing that we do, if you were to imagine us as being like a, a milking stool, um, is, that, is that we give 50% uh, of our profits to charity. So we reclaim materials, we innovate with them, and then we give half of the money away. And the reason for this is because I, uh, uh, in the crazy moment when I first met the fire brigade and I was standing there looking at these lovely fire service personnel, I thought, you guys need this money. The firefighters charity needs this money. Um, in the first year, we donated 134 pounds, so it didn't end up being a lot of money in the first year. But I think after 10 years, we're now the most significant and long-standing corporate donor to the firefighters charity, which is something we're, we're very proud of. If we grew to the size of, let's say, Mulberry, they wouldn't need to fundraise. So that's another goal for the company to pursue. If you do good things, and I think uh, that's something that we are all about, then good things happen to you. We had this stalker for ages back in sort of 2008, 2009, and someone kept calling saying, oh, I need a belt, I want a free belt, 
I am a stylist, I'm going to put it in magazines, and I thought, no, no, stalker, not having it. We don't do free stuff. There was a lot of <coughs> feedback like this. Um, and eventually she was like, no, but I work for Vogue. And I was like, I don't care who you work for. And a friend of mine just sort of came to the workshop, took a bell, set it up, you know, that sort of thing, because I wasn't prepared to play these rules that are actually quite common in the fashion sector. There's a lot of people getting away a lot of things for free. Um, thought, belt loss. And then a few months later, we weren't just sort of in this Mario Ticino shoot on Cameron Diaz. I think we can all agree the highlight of this picture is the belt. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we were on the cover of US Vogue in 2009. And suddenly, we went from being uh, <coughs> kids making belts in the shed to people who had a, you know, a fashion business, um, a, people, a company that people took seriously, that you could take these environmental goals and put them into the luxury sector uh, was completely and totally, up until that point, unheard of. And that changed for us completely in 2009, as did our sort of donations profiles of the firefighters' charity. The secret to what we do is, is, is not very secret at all. Google Maps will give you everything away. Um, I love a very good landfill site. If none of you have been to one, I highly recommend it. Take a picnic, take some binoculars. They won't let you in, most of them, unless you sort of get your backpack on and really pull out the Canadian draw and charm and things like that. Um, but you will see such amazing patterns of waste, and that is just money going into the ground. That's all it is. And what you do then, because it's illegal to take things from a landfill site as a private citizen, is you have to be more like a salmon and swim upstream to the industrial estates. So the map on your right is a map of British landfill sites, and the map on your left is the map of industrial estates. When you go to an industrial estate, you get something that is just absolutely magical. You get completely pure waste streams. And when it's pure and it's uncontaminated and there's no chaos, all you're doing is saving someone money by taking it off their hands. And that's where there's real opportunity. So for us, we started with fire hose. We are now responsible for 15 different waste streams. And each time we take responsibility for something, it's not because we think, hey, we'll solve one little hose problem for one little fire brigade. We only will take something on if we think we can be the solution, the permanent solution for that material problem. Um, you have in, uh, I think there's a lot of people here with entrepreneurial experience probably, but everybody has their bad days. And we had this horrible day back in 2010 when a big luxury player discovered our factory, bought out its capacity. Overnight we had no manufacturing. We had an American uh, distributor who ran off with loads of stock and he gave me another reason as a Canadian to dislike our neighbors to the south. Um, and I typed into Google that day, I, everybody lies, everything sucks, I hate work, blah, 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 and then clicked images, and this popped up. And it's the slow, it's the logo, whatever, for Assassin's Creed. I don't know how many of you play video games, I, I, I don't, so I definitely had no idea what that was. But this was a transition day for us, because I kept looking at this going, oh, okay, this is kind of how we work. There are no real rules, you can do whatever you want, and that's actually the business world. If you make any kind of money whatsoever, everything seems to be allowed. The oil and gas companies get away with it, the banks get away with it, so why not someone like us? But our philosophy is completely different. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a tongue twister, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck a woodchuck could chuck wood? And for us, what we decided on that day in 2010 was how much good could a good company do when a good company decides to be even better? So we started doing things like setting up manufacturing within a prison because prisoners are 60% less likely to reoffend if they've been actively engaged in employed work while they're still inside. We started employing apprentices. We actually started employing apprentices straight out of rehab, and that was a massive disaster. But you know, you have to win some, lose some. Um, but the the adventure for us really began in 2010. Uh, I suppose some people would say the hose was enough, but for us, I think uh, it's never, it's never enough. This is uh, this is a picture of a footprint. You know, in the environmental sector, we've largely failed up until this point because all we've been telling people to do <coughs> is use less, fly less, eat less, do less, reduce your footprint. And actually, my philosophy is totally the opposite. Do something amazing and do it <coughs> the best of your your best of your ability and do it at scale because we need more business models that are actually sort of planet saving, P 
people saving, and we don't need those to be uh, tiny little boutique mom and pop businesses. We need them to be big. And, and for us, that's the, the mission of now, is that we have proven, we're a track record, great, everything's good, and now we're at the point of scale. And it's actually quite an important time for us because let's say the fire hose problem, something the two of us, Elvis and I, could yeah, largely sort of comprehend and solve and scale all on our own. But this problem is completely different. We've been approached over the years by various luxury companies with their own leather waste, now let's say there's 10, 10, 12 tons of fire hose waste in London, maybe 15, 18 tons in the UK per year. There's 35,000 tons of high-end, absolutely amazing luxury leather scrap produced in Western Europe every year. So this difference of scale is absolutely enormous. Instead of coming up with a design, what Elvis and I have done is create three pieces that you can recombine indefinitely to make geometric shapes in two or three dimensions. So it's a totally, it's the, the world's first totally circular luxury good. Um, and it's something that we launched very, very softly and now have a huge American distributor for and lots of German distributors for, but British people seem really slow on the uptake of this one, so we'll see what happens. But this is the point and this is the material where we actually need to scale not just the business itself, but the governance of the business, the team behind the business, and everything else. And not for any reason other than if we don't, I can't solve the leather race problem. It has to be something that a team achieves, and that team has to grow, or we can't do justice to this problem. Uh, this is Elvis, just so you don't think it's a name that we came up with you know, for Google. Um, the business is, a, a, to a certain degree, about love, I would say, for sure. Not enough businesses are, and if I didn't have a business partner that I was also in love with, the business would have fallen apart a long time ago. We don't have a work-life balance, we have a life, and work is a big part of that. So I think if you talk about bloody-mindedness, that's certainly something that we have, but we both do yoga, so we're very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my second favorite man, he's a very famous Canadian, he's the best ice hockey player of all time. And the reason why he was so successful is he was always one step ahead. He used to say, I don't chase the puck around, I imagine where the puck is going to go and that's where I'm going to be. And everything that Elvis and I do is based on that philosophy, but not in terms of where is the market going. It's where is the planet going to be in 2050 when we have no water, when we are going to be manufacturing according to catch of the day because there's no raw material supply. Everything that we do and everything that we design is based on that 2050 paradigm. And those, I think, are the kind of partners that we want to bring on board. People who see where the world is going and don't like it and want to get their hands dirty fixing it. Thank you.